It is a Tuesday, October 8th edition of the Fenway Rundown podcast. I'm Chris Cotillo, Sean McAdam alongside Red Sox not making much news, but there was some very sad news uh, in the world of the Red Sox today. Louis Tiant passes away at age 83. Um, Sean, before we really get into uh, the mailbag that we're going to dig into, and there are a lot of questions and we appreciate those, I know Louis Tiant, someone you've known for a long time, um, so if you could just give us a remembrance of him. Yeah, uh, I think of him, Chris, as a larger-than-life personality, and he showed that on the mound, too, which I think was one of the reasons he was so popular with not just Red Sox fans, but baseball fans. He was the kind of guy that even if you weren't rooting for his team, I think you would like um, he showed his personality on the mound. He had that unique corkscrew delivery. And I'll always remember the 1975 World Series and Joe Garagiola saying something to the effect here, and I'm paraphrasing, that if you're in Fenway Park tonight, there's a very good chance that Louis Tiant will at one point look you right in the eye. And that was in reference to him with his complete, 180 degree delivery where he would look out toward the center field bleachers before delivering the pitch. It was the kind of delivery we don't see anymore. He had some personality. He had fun. And not unlike what happened with Pedro Martinez, who arrived in town about 20 years after Louis Tiant left the Red Sox, Tiant starts in the 70s were similar to those of Pedro's, which is to say they were events and you didn't want to miss them because you knew that not only were you going to see a highly competitive, likely very good pitching performance, but you were also going to be entertained by what he did on the mound. And in his post-retirement, uh, where he was around the Red Sox a good deal over the last two decades, particularly in spring training as a special advisor, he was like the team's goodwill ambassador. He would endlessly sign autographs for fans in spring training. Just don't get in the way of him and his golf cart because he drove like a madman around that Fort Myers JetBlue spring training complex, but that was part of the charm. He and Jim Rice ribbing one another, going back and forth with insults that can't be repeated here. Um, he did much the same with Carly Stremsky during his uh, playing days, very playful, uh, big personality in the clubhouse, and that fun-loving nature carried with him right to the end. And I think a pillar of the community, too, a guy who was around you know, long after his retirement. He lived in uh, my backyard in Central Mass and South Bro for a number of years, so you know, it seems like whenever a bank opened or a Dick Sporting Goods or whatever it was, They'd call him, he'd sign autographs, come out and meet people. It was always around Fenway. And, you know, uh, I collected autographs as a kid. And, you know, he was always around, always signing, always in, in, interacting with the fans in a way you don't see from everybody. Yep. And I would run into him occasionally in Wells, Maine, where he had a place uh, over the last 10 years. I remember about five years ago, walking through the parking lot of a Hannaford's supermarket in wells because i spend a lot of time in a gunkwit during the summer here we go and uh being scared half to death as i walked through the parking lot with a man blaring his horn from behind and i turned around to find louis tiant behind the wheel cracking up and waving at me as he drove by and later in the store signing autographs shaking hands posing for pictures i never saw him once turn down a request for uh, an audience or a signature or a picture. He loved being around people and people love being around him. And I remember sitting next to you just 10 days ago at Fenway, they showed him in the legend suite. Um, we were talking about, you know, he'd been declining health, but able to come to Fenway. That might've been the last game of the season. If not, you know, at least the last weekend he was shown yep. on the video board and got a nice ovation from the fans, which we now know will be for the last time. So uh, important to remember him and a lot of people looking back with extremely fond memories today. Yeah. And, and a great career um, that was probably not properly appreciated uh, both in its time and afterward. Uh, if you look at his career numbers, 
They are nearly identical to those of Jim Catfish Hunter. Uh, they were within a couple of wins of one another. They were within a couple of decimal points of career ERA. The difference being that Catfish Hunter had the great platform of pitching for those great Oakland teams, making it to three World Series with them, and then a couple of more with the Yankees after he signed as a free agent there. Uh, Louie made three World Series starts in his career, all of them in 1975. Two of them were great, including a complete game shutout in Game 1, I believe, and also uh, another masterful performance in Game 4. He also starts Game 6, which can make the case was not necessarily because of his performance, which was just okay that night, but maybe the most famous World Series game of all time with the Bernie Carbo and Carlton Fisk extra inning home run. Um, so Tiant was part of that and sadly never got a lot of Hall of Fame support. Uh, I think at the time he was on the ballot, people expected starting pitchers to be closer to 300 career wins. He was only at 229. But as I said, so was Catfish Hunter, and Hunter got lifted by the fact that he had opportunities to perform more and well in the World Series, where Al Tiant only pitched twice in the postseason in his career in 1970, briefly with the Twins, and then in 1975 with the Red Sox. So that, that's the Louis Tiant remembrance. Today is a mailbag episode, as promised. We did uh, open up the text line and ask people to contribute. Sean, how exactly did they do that, and how can others join? Well, it's funny you should ask, Chris, because it's quite easy to join and take part. All you have to do is text the word join to 617-751-6257, then click the link to subscribe. That will get you a free 14-day trial period. After that, there'll be a $4.99 per month charge. You get up-to-date breaking news. You get lineups during the season. You get the chance to ask questions of us all the time. And on days like today, or leading up to days like today, the opportunity to provide questions for mailbag episodes like the one you're about to hear. Yep. And so we have a ton. Uh, we have probably 30. There's a ton of overlap. Uh, we don't want to make this a 75-minute episode. So if you don't hear your name, we got the question. We appreciate it. We're trying to get to it. I've said this before. The way the platform uh, looks is that I can't see the questions before I click on them, then they go away. So we're going to try. Uh, but people, you know, if you don't hear your name, uh, we still appreciate the question. We've still seen it and we hope to get to it. But it's kind of a fire drill once we start these and uh, there's no way around it. So with that being said, we will start with a question. Uh, well, it's from an anonymous number, um, but we will start here because I think it's topical right now. Do you guys anticipate any changes to the coaching staff or the front office? Um, Breslow could bring in new blood, could be a GM, all that type of stuff. I'll say this. A lot of teams are announcing their coaching changes right now. The Red Sox have not done so. I think we're in agreement, Sean, that a few guys are safe. Uh, you know, Andrew Bailey is not going anywhere after year one. And that's, you know, the most important coach on the staff. Ramon Vasquez is one of Cora's best friends. It's the bench coach. He'll probably be safe. Uh, it seems like Kyle Hudson's got a great reputation over there. The one big question there could be Pete Fatsy, but if anything, you know, seems like maybe lower um, positions, assistance that could be go gone. Yeah, and you also wonder about the poor performance of the bullpen, whether that might impact some jobs. Um, my guess is we see one or two small changes to the staff. Um, I don't see Fatsy being in trouble, and I don't believe he should be. Yes, the Red Sox certainly had a tough six weeks at the end offensively. We all can remember those games where they were getting good starting pitching performances, but losing 2-0, 2-1, 3-2, 3-1. Uh, there were a ton of those games down the stretch, but for about four months, that was a top five offense. And I don't think Pats, uh, Patsy's done anything to lose that position um, it would surprise me if he were to be sacrificed, but maybe some assistants go or some smaller changes. As far as the front office, well, we know that Craig Breslow wants to hire a general manager. Two questions. How soon does that happen? Um, I don't think it's probably going to be in time for the GM meetings, which are about 
uh, three weeks away right now. Um, and then the, uh, the question is, is it an internal promotion? Does he take uh, one of the guys or people who are now serving as assistant GMs and elevate them to general manager? Or is there somebody from his past, somebody he worked with with the Cubs, someone with whom he's familiar from his playing career, someone from another organization for a fresh set of eyes? Do they bring somebody in from the outside? We know there's going to be a GM, just don't know where he or she is coming from and how quickly that's going to get done. Right, and it doesn't seem like there's a mandate, as you mentioned, to get that done in the next few weeks before opening day. Any of that, I think Craig Breslow is going to look at the candidates both internally and externally and see um, you know, what happens there. There are a few questions on this topic. I wrote about it today for my uh, infield roster analysis. The idea of uh, potentially trading Tristan Casas, moving Rafael Devers, that was something floated by Ken Rosenthal a couple weeks ago. And as you look at the Red Sox infield, it's a very crowded mix. So three questions in that vein. I'll get to them in order. Jeff asks, and this is interesting because I know we're on opposite sides of this debate, which one you prefer? Which one would you prefer trading for a top line pitcher, Duran or Casas? Ralph asks any gut feelings as to whether or not Alonzo remains a Met. With all the Casas trade speculation, if he were to be moved, Alonzo seems like a great fit here. And then Barbara Savage asking a two part question, ending with, "Do you believe Casas, as reported, is likely to be traded?" I'll say this: I don't think that theory came from no from nothing. I don't think it came from thin air. With Ken Rosenthal, very plugged in. Um, and speculation, even when it's speculation with those guys, is not. But to me, I just don't. Uh, I think, first of all, the whole idea that the Red Sox are pissed off at Tristan Casas or sick of his act, I think that that stuff's way overblown when it comes to potential trades. This guy's not a clubhouse problem. He's quirky. We get it. We've been over it. There were points where he pissed them off. Guns and knives. We all understand that. Still, he's an elite performer at a position where they don't have much coming. Um, and I think that whole theory, there's so many moving parts there. You're asking a lot out of everybody. You Number one, you have to move Casas and get enough back for him. Number two, you have to move Devers to first base. Who knows if he's going to be good over there? Who knows if he's not going to be pissed off over there? And number three, as part of one of Ken's theories, you you know sign Alex Bregman. Who knows where his co- Alex core relationship stands? Or Willie Adamas, you move him to third, a position he hasn't played. Like There's just 50 moving parts there that... Yeah, it's outside of the box. It's fine. But my guess is that Casas and Devers are both in their corner spots to start the year, and they figure out the middle from there, probably with Story at short, figure out who takes second, and then when Meyer and Campbell are ready, you know, it's a good problem to have. Uh, but my answer to that question is is to trade Duran instead of Casas if you have to trade one of them. Duran's older. Um, he's probably hit his peak. You can sell high. To me, Casas is not, and he's a guy who's always a blue-chip prospect, has kind of passed every test. You know, I think Red Sox fans underrate him because he's weird, you know, and that's just, uh, he's still elite. uh, And I think we can't get away from that. Okay. A few things. Uh, I think it's premature to label Tristan Casas elite. He has shown that he has plus or plus plus power at times, but he has had difficulty being consistent. And if we're talking about, where someone is in their career. And I know that the rib injury last year was the ultimate freak injury. It wasn't anything that anyone could have anticipated, but there has to be at least a little concern that Casas has had a couple of seasons now interrupted by injury and that he is a slow healer coming back from those. Also, he is not even league average defensively, and I'm not sure he's ever going to be. He is right now below average as a defender. So he does two things well. Uh, He gets on base because he will take his walks, as we know, and he has great raw power. Those are things that are important, but they're not irreplaceable in a team's organization. Meanwhile, Uh, Jaron Duran is a legitimate five-tool player now. Power, speed, defense, bat-to-ball. Throwing is maybe not elite, but it's at least average or above average. And he has made himself out to be a very good uh, defender, both in left and center field. Also, yes, he's older, but he's 28. And I do not think that we've seen the best of Jaron Duran. 
This was clearly his breakout season. I think he can be even a little better. I think he's motivated even to be a little better. So um, I, I, I don't like the idea of moving Devers over to first because I think that is fraught with complications, and you highlighted a couple of them. This is a guy who's kind of worked but is now only maybe average at third base. How is he going to take to a new position and new responsibilities? We don't know. And the people that are being talked about to replace him at third base, as you noted, Adamas has not played third base in his pro career. And P.S., he strikes out a ton. And this is already a lineup that does that too often. So while you're getting 35 home run power out of him, you're asking him to play a new position and you're adding a lot, one more swing and miss person to that lineup. So I don't like that. I've always been a Bregman fan, but it's clear he's starting to go downhill. Mm -hmm. He's already in his early 30s. He's starting to regress a little bit. And I think you could have a wild overpay to bring him in on a five or six year deal. I'm not sure what the solution is. I am sure that neither Adamas or Bregman should be part of it. Yeah, I mean, the the Casas thing for me is he's, you know, like I said, younger on the ascent. If you're trading him, you are dealing at probably reduced value after he missed most of the year. If you have to trade one of the two of them, Duran is at the peak of his value after, you know, the year he had and showing the skills he did. I, and I, I, just, I don't think I don't think Casas's value has been reduced or minimized by missing half a year. People know the raw power is there, that he's 24 and he's going to be under control for, what, four and a half seasons, five seasons more after that. That's the appeal there. Great raw power and control and age. But, but I, I, they also don't have to trade either of them and they probably won't. That's true. That's true. But I also don't like their chances of spending two hundred million on Pete Alonso to come in and either be the DH or the first baseman. Um, I, I don't see that happening. I think just you know you you trade Yoshida, you open up that DH spot, you sign another guy from the right-handed side, whether it be O'Neill, whoever it might be. You have Campbell as a right-handed hitter. You know the position player group. People want to add, want to add, want to add. When really they need to subtract, and we'll get to that for sure. Uh, Joe Gleason asked a question about the GM search that we got to. Two questions from uh, Charlie Kernan and Frank Prinsky uh, about the Big Four. Of the so-called Big Four, who might be ready to make the big league club next season with a good spring training? And Charlie Kernan asked, uh, what's the likelihood that the big moves this offseason have more to do with creating spots for those guys and not signing a top free agent? Uh, I'll start with this because I wrote about it uh, last night for this morning. I think at this point, you can't imagine that Meyer is going to make the opening day roster with zero at bats at AAA. Um, so that makes it seem like Trevor Story, you know, come hell or high water is your opening day shortstop. I don't think he has any trade value and they do value his defense and as a leader. I think Teal, Anthony, and Campbell are going to be in the mix in spring training. You know, Campbell and Teal have had, uh, you know, all three of them really have had quick ascents, Campbell and Teal being drafted just a year ago. I think they'll be in the mix. That's not a guarantee that they will um, make it. And in terms of of trades uh, on the other side of this and, and clearing spots, I think it can be dangerous to you know trade bona fide major leaguers if you have them to clear spots for guys that look they're ultra talented. They're among the top you know twenty five prospects in the game. They've kind of passed every test to this point, but they still could be busts. Uh, and that's always in play when you're talking about players this young. Um, we look at it from an analysis perspective and fans from a fan perspective as, oh, well, where are, you know, Meyer, Story, Rafaela, uh, Grissom, David Hamilton, Campbell, all these guys going to fit in in the middle infield. The Red Sox look at that and say, you know, the more the merrier. We saw it this year, you know, where they had uh, Zach Short starting at shortstop all of a sudden when they had a glut of middle infielders to start. The last thing I'll say on this, ranking them, and somebody asked this somewhere else, and I'll, I'll get to the name, but... Uh, in terms of least likely to be traded to most likely to be traded, I would guess Anthony's untouchable as the number one prospect in the game. It's just hard to see them moving off him. I would say Teal is possibly untouchable just because, you know, top catching prospects who can hit don't grow on trees. And that puts Meyer and Campbell as the two guys I think they could move. 
You could sell extremely high on Campbell after one good year. Uh, you'd be selling low on Meyer because he's now you know missed uh, some time in the last two years. I agree that Anthony is the most untouchable in part because of how well he has performed as a pro who's just over 20 years old now, and his ceiling would seem to be through the roof. And the fact that he's either, you know, the best or top ranked prospect in the game, or certainly no matter who's doing the rankings, the top five, to me, he's the most untouchable. I put Campbell second, and I appreciate what you're saying about the importance of the catching position and how rare it is to get one of those guys. But um, I think Campbell has just exploded as a prospect who they could envision playing any number of four positions, maybe could be short, could be second, could be the outfield, could even be third base in a while. If they ended up moving uh, Devers across the infield or two DH. So there's a lot there. Uh, I would, probably put um, Meyer third and, uh, excuse me, uh, I, I would put Campbell second, second most difficult or, or to, to imagine trading them. And then you're talking about uh, Meyer and Teal, who are about equal, playing important positions up the middle, uh, but not quite in that same untouchable class, certainly as Anthony and maybe not as Campbell. Eric Herbeck asked a similar question. How would you rank most likely to least likely the prospects are very young players to be traded to acquire pitching? I'd put Meyer at the top of that list. He mentions Willier Abreu. He's a guy that, like, to me, does Willier have the ceiling of Roman Anthony? No, but he's proven that he can be a major league player now over the course of, you know, a full season plus with a little yeah, bit the, of an the, the there. thing he's got to beat is the platoon aspect. Right. He's got to figure out how to hit lefties at least a little better than he has. They haven't given him a lot of opportunities and the ones he's had, he hasn't done much with. So can he grow into a guy that can play 140 plus games or is he 120 plus games because he can't do anything against lefties? Good defender, outstanding throwing arm, power, uh, a lot to like, but he's got to be able to He's got to be able to prove that he can play nearly every day. Jay Dawson asked, to the extent the Red Sox have a surplus of position prospects, is it reasonable to think they can trade some of that surplus for pitching, similar to the York and Priester trade? And are there any targets on the pitching side? You know, there are definitely places where you can do that. People look at Seattle, which Jerry DePoto said unlikely. Uh, people obviously look at Crochet in Chicago. The Giants have some young arms. The Cubs, which Craig Breslow knows well, they do as well. I think they have to do this. You know, the York yep. Priester trade is just an example of what the organization needs to do. You know, maybe you see that in a larger scale with, you know, Meyer or somebody for a top arm. But, you know, they've been talking about this for a year. I don't think it's a priority. I think it's a necessity at this point. I agree. And I've been on record as saying I do not expect them to be in competition for guys like Corbin Burns and Max Fried. Uh, that is not John Henry's M.O., it wasn't his M.O. when he was spending a lot of money. It sure as hell isn't his M.O. now that he's watching every dollar on the payroll. So uh, given the the rate of Tommy John injuries and pitchers being lost for a year or more, as we just saw with Lucas Giolito, um, there's inherent risk to going after guys, even like someone like Burns, who has been incredibly durable. And that's part of his selling point. But you can also look at that as, well, you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah, the guy pitches 180 plus innings every year. But when does that start catching up to him? Does it happen at 31? Does it happen at 33? Whatever it is, it's going to happen on your watch if you sign him because he's going to get a mega length deal, probably six, if not seven, even greater. I mean, you're, you're looking at a, probably something very close to what Garrett Cole got from the Yankees. So you see the Red Sox doing that? I don't. And if you need high-end, front-of-the-rotation starters, you're going to have to trade for them. And guess what? Just like spending two to $300 million for an ace as a free agent is painful and risky, so is it going to be trading for one because you're going to have to give up multiple good young pitchers to get one.
They need to make the sale deal again. And if it works Excuse out, me, well, I said multiple good young pitchers. I meant position players. Right. And they have a surplus of them, but they're not going to get that future ace by trading Sedan Raffaella and a low, you know, and a kid from single A. You're going to have to deal from either among the big four or, you know, multiple combinations of young major leaguers and very high end prospects. Tanner Horlick asking, are there any real expectations in free agency other than Giolito type signings? Are they going to be real players for Freed, Bregman, et cetera? You answer that question with a resounding no. Yeah, I, I, I mean, to me, there's less of a risk of them going after a bat because as expensive as those guys are, there isn't the injury factor risk that you have with pitchers. And uh, the guys we're talking about, yeah, uh, Bregman and Adamas are going to get their money but they're not going to get, you know, 200, 250 million dollars. They could be players for one of those guys after all the dust settles, but it almost has to be done after you make that trade for pitching, uh, or at least you identify who you're going to move for pitching and know who you have to replace. Justin from Georgia, Mike Granger, and there was. Uh one other here about the bullpen asking questions about the bullpen justin asked how the red sox build a solid bullpen from where they are right now who from the current roster and the minors feel good to be part of it next year and what does that leave for everything else to round out other roles mike granger asking about garrett whitlock being the closer or a reliever next year i think the plan in the bullpen is is actually pretty simple you're losing kenley jansen you're losing chris martin but between you know, let's say five guys who have shown flashes either here or before in their career. Slayton, Hendricks, um, Guerrero, who was really good down the stretch. I know it's a small sample size, but throws 100, all that stuff. Whitlock, who has been a dominant reliever in the past. And my guess is they're going to just put him in the bullpen, even though we don't know that for sure. And you throw Zach Kelly into the mix uh, as a righty who had a really good first half, hit the wall in the second. We know about that. And you have Weissert and some of these other guys in those middle roles. I think you can find a closer and an eighth inning guy out of that mix. And I think, you know, that's probably Slayton and Hendricks and Whitlock in some form or fashion. I actually think, and I'll write this later this week in the bullpen analysis, that their biggest free agent expenditure is going to be a high-octane lefty reliever like Tanner Scott. Just pay the guy to be elite. Stop mixing and matching and going through the Bailey Horns and the Cam Boozers of the world from the left-handed side and just get a really established lefty. There's been some talk that they want to do that. That's my guess on how they're going to approach the bullpen. I could see them you know, handing out a big-time reliever contract. Yeah, I, I could see that too, and I agree. I think that's absolutely a need. Uh, a swing and miss lefty, a Josh Hader type. <clears throat> Not Hader himself, who's in the middle of a multi-year deal with Houston and um, is not as we know uh, as long as as far as we know on the market but somebody who fits that profile who can pitch late in the game and can get swing and miss and is not some you know 91 mile an hour junk ball guy from the left side that seemed to be a dime a dozen uh, they need somebody that can really uh, strike people out and Tanner Scott is one obvious target um, I'll have to look at the list of free agent relievers and see if there are others. But either through trade or free agency, they need an impact lefty. Uh, they haven't had one for a long time. Uh, they keep trying to, you know, find one on the scrap heap, whether it be Bernardino, uh, who's useful and probably will be back, but he doesn't fit that kind of profile. He's more of a, you know, sixth and seventh inning guy. They need somebody that can come in and, uh, you know, and match up with the Juan Sotos of the world in the late innings with the game on the line in high leverage spots, and that will not come cheaply. And, you know, there's a lot of veterans available from the Matt Moores of the world to the Will Smiths, the guys that are there, you know, every year. Scott, I think, you know, in a different category. Um, but there is kind of a crowded mix of those guys that will be available, maybe somebody via trade. I just do think that's a big-time need. Joseph Higgins and Justin Woolman both asking us questions about uh, the need specifically, uh, what positions are they looking for in free agency and trade? Like, what are the top priorities? Joseph asked, can we do it one through five uh, to prioritize the Red Sox needs? 
Uh, I'll do it this way. Starting rotation, uh, an ace is number one. The lefty reliever is probably two. Um, backup catcher, not a huge catcher is going to be priority, but list. something they in between they there, absolutely right absolutely need to find. Right, right-handed pop in the middle there. Right, um, I, I would, then, I would put that in front of the lefty reliever as important as that. I would go front end starter, righty power bat lefty swing and miss reliever and backup catcher. I don't think they need much more than that in terms of position players because of the influx they have. Now, who's staying and who's going is going to be a big part of that puzzle. But as you look at that lineup, you don't say, oh, well, they need uh, a first baseman or they need a center fielder. Yeah, second base is kind of up in the air and it could go to anybody from story moving over to make room for Meyer. It could be Campbell. It could be Grissom. It could be some platoon involving Hamilton. They have some options in house. So I don't see them looking to fill any positions on the field other than backup catcher and a righty power bat. And then the question is, where does that guy play? Does he play left field? Does he DH? Um, does he replace somebody that they trade if they move, uh, if they move Casas for pitching, do they look for a right-handed first baseman like Alonzo? I don't see that, but somewhere they need a righty power bat that will fit into what they have. Tyler O'Neill, like as kind of limited as he can be as your primary DH who can mix in in the outfield. And with the Yoshida trade, like that makes a lot of sense or somebody in that mold still. Do you make. think there is any chance they give him the qualifying offer, which for those who aren't sure, uh, will be a little over 21 million for 2025. So that is the average of the top 20% of all players uh, salaries from the previous year. And it's figured out by Major League Baseball and the Players Association. And it has been determined, although I'm not sure we've seen an exact number, somewhere around $21 million. So it's a significant commitment. But for a guy like O'Neill, who you worry about in terms of getting into his 30s and his availability, yeah, it's an overpay, but it takes it kicks that can down the road for one more year and He'd takes care of take it, it, even if you're paying him probably five or six million more than he might make on a free agent deal. And they can afford to do it. They avoid the long-term yep. contract. The thing I think that plays into that is that you kind of need to move Yoshida to accommodate him uh, and have him be in that D8 spot. And you have to commit to O'Neill in you know early November without having a Yoshida deal lined up. And then you take away the leverage of that too. So, Well, I mean, they're not going to have leverage anyway because they're going to have to eat at least half of what's left right. on the almost $60 million due to Yoshida over the next three years. They're going to take a beating on that no matter what the timing is. So while I understand your point, I think it's less of a factor in this because everyone knows if you're going to move him, you're going to have to eat a good chunk of it to facilitate it. Uh, Adam Shapiro asks, because you have to give up to get, how likely is it that Duran, Anthony Campbell, Rafaela Abreu are all in camp together? Is that too crowded of an outfield mix? It feels like you have to move one, but to me, and, and Campbell, I think, profiles more as a second baseman anyway, but to me, you know, having Rafaela be your super utility guy off the bench instead of an everyday player on a contending roster kind of makes a lot more sense. Um but it just does feel like one of them have to move. We talked about Duran and Willer, Willier already. Well, I, I mean, you also go into it with the uh, with the understanding that Anthony does not have to make the opening day roster and that nobody um, would second guess them sending him to Worcester for six weeks or two months at the start of the year just to make sure he's ready to make that jump. He is young, um, so they have some time there. And maybe some things play out in the early season that crystallizes their thinking and enables them to make some moves. But you do have the luxury of certainly sending Anthony back to AAA to start the year. Chris Connor asking a long question about a lot of needs, stuff we've gotten to, one about Yoshida, and ask about signing Jose Iglesias as a depth platoon piece. To me, I mean, I think there's just too many infielders already. You have Romy Gonzalez, you have David Hamilton, Emmanuel Valdez, all those guys, even if you know some of them are traded, still have a surplus 
Tom Ritchie ask about my Yoshida story from last week. What about moving him to Seattle for Robbie Ray? Two years, $46 million remaining. Obviously, they have some pretty good starters that are, um, you know, in the mix. That's the type of creative deal, you know, that well, I guess he's Robbie Ray is uh, in San Francisco. San Francisco. Now, so, um, that mistake's been made before. <laughs> um, but I mean, those are the types of deals where, you know, you could potentially try to get something for Yoshida, a guy that, you know, has been hurt and not obviously scion quality since he won it. Um, but to me, those are the types of deals you have to look at where if you can balance it out and get a pitcher and have a team that might be interested in Masa, that's kind of the, the perfect storm. Usually those things happen to work out better on paper than they do in real life. And that's always uh, part of the battle. Yeah. I, I mean, they're going to have to get creative. And I think um, Breslow has that capability of, you know, looking into some things that uh, might not make sense on the surface, but, um gives it's them like some sale options. for Grissom. What a great one that was. Yeah. Well, um, but I, I I think that they're going to be open to a bunch of different solutions because they have some clear needs and it's not going to be easy to fill them. Jim Foley asked a similar question about the outfield that we've gotten to with also with a nice remembrance of uh Louis Tiant in the parking lot at JetBlue Park. These three questions are very similar. We'll get to all of them right here. Scott Pratt on a scale from one to 10, 10 being very aggressive. How aggressive do you see the Red Sox ownership being this off season? Thomas McCready. Do you believe Breslow when he says the team will be aggressive and decisive in free agency? And he comes through the organization insinuating John Henry and Jonathan Morrison. What are the realistic expectations for the Sox this winter? What would you guys say would be a surprise acquisition? I mean, they're really in a similar spot to where they were a year ago. Uh, with the added bullpen need, they really didn't ne need much in terms of the bullpen because they had Jansen and Martin coming back. They needed right-handed pop to balance. They swapped out Verdugo for O'Neill. They needed starting pitching. They tried Giolito for sale. It didn't really work out, but they still need the ace. They still need to balance the lineup. It's still, you know, all of those things, plus your prospects are a year closer to me. Um, I think they're going to make a blockbuster trade. I think they, they kind of have to. We thought that a year ago. Free agency, again, you know, maybe not a $250 million contract, but I think they'll spend a little bit because they can. They have the money to, even if the payroll is not way up there. Tanner Scott, somebody like that. Um, I do think they're going to make impact additions compared to last year. It's almost it'll be hard not to. Um, is it going to be, you know, Corbin Burns and Willie Adamas? Probably not. But is it going to be an ace on the trade market and maybe, you know, a pretty good relief free agent? I think that that's more realistic. And I do think they are going to, you know, put together a roster that's going to be better than the one they just had. Yeah. I, I think Breslow is going to be aggressive. I just would not expect that aggressiveness to take the form of chasing after a Burns or a freed. I don't think they're going to get their frontline pitcher in free agency. I do think they're going to try to get one and it'll be done in the trade. And I agree with you. I think they could make some other significant free agent signings, just not those two guys. Matthew Levine with a good question. During last offseason, people were talking about Andrew Bailey as the biggest offseason acquisition. With the benefit of hindsight, what are your thoughts on Bailey and the new pitching infrastructure? Uh, how much the starters and bullpen faltered after the All-Star break? We've talked about this, um, and I think you know this is something that's been a theme throughout the year. If you look at it where they finished, 6th or 7th in rotation ERA with Giolito out for the year, and I think you know, you'll, you'll take that. Houck took a step forward. Crawford took a step forward. That's that's what you needed. But those guys are who they are. None of them project as number ones. Andrew Bailey, even working his magic, got the most out of them, and they still need that ace. I do think that the philosophy of you know limiting your fastballs and waiting on or just throwing a lot of breaking stuff came back to hurt them in the second half. You know, teams were saying they were game planning for that. The adjustment in season didn't come. You know, in time. And next year, I think you know they're going to have to be more proactive with that. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. I think Bailey did overall a good job. Uh, certainly, uh, perhaps not as good as it seemed a month or six weeks or two months into the season. But the fact that they went from 16th or 17th in starter ERA a year ago to sixth overall with essentially the same group, all three of those guys, Crawford, uh, Hauk, and Bayo pitched on the team in 2023 and did not have anywhere near that level of success, but now have, um, I, I still think you give 
positive marks for Bailey and what he was able to accomplish, but there's more work to be done. And I would also caution that, you know, to, to fairly evaluate Bailey is not something that can be done in one year because it's not just the results of the major league staff. It's also the pitching program and the infrastructure that he's overseeing in the organization. How quickly do guys like Sandlin move up and be major league pitchers? Um, how quickly do some of their guys that they had, the international prospects um, that, you know, that may be future major league starters, how do they come along? Uh, those ultimately are going to be the kinds of things we judge Andrew Bailey's tenure on. Uh, about five more promise for moving through these fast. John McSheffrey asked a question very similar about, you know, who do you move? Who do you keep? John, we appreciate the question. As you did note in your question, I'm sure lots of people are asking it. That's for sure. And I think we've covered that. And the best way to answer it is there's so many possibilities. It's hard to predict. Uh, I would say, you know, probably uh, an outfielder, but I, I couldn't even give you a guess. Maxwell Grant with a specific question with Kyle Teal emerging. Do you see the Red Sox re-signing Danny Jansen or letting him walk? They do need somebody in that mold. The problem was he wasn't very good down the stretch. Maybe he has an edge on the rest of the free agent market because he has familiarity with the pitching staff. But, I mean, they do need somebody in that mold. I don't know. But take your yeah, pick of, I, I, of like the 15. Be. I mean, guys. whoever it is, it's somebody that, you know, probably he's not going to play more than 40 or so games maximum. Um, whether that number one guy is Wong at the start or Teal not long after the season begins, and then Wong is relocated to the backup, and whoever this guy we're talking about is now extraneous, we don't know. But they need a, a you know, a, a bona fide backup catcher who has done it before. I wouldn't rule Jansen out, but as you noted, he was a huge disappointment offensively. I thought he caught pretty well, um, but he did not deliver them that kind of right-handed thump that they were envisioning. We heard all this talk about perhaps the being full side power. Yeah, yeah. Where was that? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the guy ended up with uh, an under 600 OPS, I think, in his time here. Michael Bryant asks, what is Theo actually doing for the Red Sox? Does it seem like Henry is as involved as Kennedy claimed? I tweeted it. I'll say it here. We appreciate Sam for coming on. Yes. They can't keep saying that they don't understand why people don't think John Henry is involved. He hasn't talked about the team. He's barely seen it Fenway. It's like they hate the narrative, yet they just feed it. And I cannot stand that from them. I've said it for years now. Uh, so it's impossible to say if Henry is involved, they can claim it. They can claim it as much as they want until he, you know, talks, makes promises, all these things hard to envision. Sean, well, have you, I, go ahead. I, I would say this, that it is possible for Henry to be involved and we're not privy to it, uh, but there's no public evidence that he's involved. Um, so maybe I'm splitting semantic cares there. Mm -hmm. um, I have no doubt that, that John Henry wants the Red Sox to be successful, how involved he is either, either during the season or off season, what input he's providing other than sort of supervising things and, and enabling those who work for him to execute those plans. We don't know. Um, but it is hard to say with certitude that Henry is impacting the direction of the team when we don't see any evidence of that. Doesn't mean it's not happening, but we can't prove it. Yeah, my point is just like they keep saying, like, people who don't talk to John have no idea how involved he is. Huh. Why would that be? And what about Theo? Yeah, I'm sure that Theo has been a good sounding board for Breslow. Um, not on, you know, should we claim this guy on waivers and... Um, you know, what about signing this six year minor league free agent? They're not going to bother him with that, but bigger picture stuff. I think he's providing his input and having Breslow be the beneficiary of his experience, which is obviously considerable. Nathan Farrell asks us for this. I'm not one for making up trade scenarios. Good. Cause it's hard. Uh, but what's a three point plan to have this team reach 90 wins. I'll do this. Number one, trade Yoshida and re-sign either O'Neal or a bat, a right-handed bat in that mold who can mix in at DH, but also keep that spot open if you want to put Devers there, Casas on a certain day, whatever. Part two is trade for an ace. Empty the cupboard of the position players. 
do what you have to do to get somebody. There's some, you know, guy who's going to emerge on the trade market. Or, you that you we don't need know to about. find someone else's scoobal. Yep. You got to identify uh, who the next guy is going to be with a couple of years of service time that is going to emerge in 2025 and beyond as an honest to goodness number one starter in the mold of scoobal. Not easy. Not a lot of guys uh, to to classify as such. But that is what they're tasked with. If you're not going to pluck the best guys out of free agency because of risk and cost, then you have to do a uh, a faultless job of identifying the guy who's going to make that next step and be the 2025 version of Scooble. And my third point, sign Tanner Scott. So we get Scott, Yoshida out, a right-handed bat, O'Neill or someone else in, and then your ace. It's not a very long list, but I think that and the prospects coming up, you have a pretty good team heading in. And then the hardest question of all from Peter Tebow, friend of the program, what will be the starting lineup and pitching rotation on opening day in 2025? Yeah. It's, uh, I would say, um, uh, if if we got this right, we should buy every. This Powerball is like guessing the, the number of jelly beans in a jar at this point. Yes, I'm going to say the parts I've already said. Uh, Casas and Devers are still there. Stories in it. I would say Meyer is the one who gets traded, but he wasn't going to be on the roster anyway. So you have, you know, Rafaela Duran and Abreu out there. Uh, O'Neill or somebody in that mold is your DH. And I'll, I'll say Teal starts on opening day. How about that as my bold call? Uh, I'm going to envision a package deal of, involving Abreu and Meyer to get the necessary starting pitcher they're looking for. Um, I, too, could see Tanner Scott being a signing, um, and I would not be surprised if Casas is traded. So that is the beginning of our offseason bold predictions. They're half-baked because it's October 8th. We're not. The predictions are, just for the record. And, uh, you know, those are going to be wrong. But that's what we have to talk about on October 8th, as well as breaking news that just came in. The Patriots are starting Drake May on Sunday. So go Heels and go Pats. Sean, one more time for, uh, first of all, thank you to everybody who submitted these questions. There was a ton of them. I'm going to need some water. Uh, but how do you, if you are at home listening to this, get involved for the next one? Simply text the word join to 617-751-6257. Then click the link to subscribe. That will give you a free 14-day trial period which you can sample all the breaking news during the season. It's lineups as soon as they're announced. It's roster moves. It's the ability to ask any of us, myself, Chris, or Chris Smith questions, or to provide questions for episodes like the one you just listened to, $4.99 per month after your free two-week trial. Again, we appreciate the questions. If we didn't get to you, we still read it, uh, but... A lot of repetition and uh, a lot of redundancy at this point in the offseason because nothing's done. We'll be back with another episode later in the week.